let's suppose that uh, for some perverse reason that we're interested in ruining an economy and a society. Uh, so to make the problem interesting, uh, we should select a difficult case. So say not the Central African Republic, where it could be done very easily. So let's pick a rich and powerful society. And best of all, let's uh, select the richest and most powerful society in history, uh, one with incomparable advantages, one that's fortunately close at hand, namely our own. Uh, so a good way to start is to ask uh, what would be signs of a successful economy? Well, to begin with, it should have uh, people who are eager to work, uh, plenty of uh, badly needed work uh, that should be done, and ample resources to combine uh, idle hands with uh, needed work. And that picture helps us sketch what a failed economy would look like, uh, the opposite in all respects. And we don't have to look very far. Uh, right here, there are tens of millions of people eager to work, uh, but with no jobs. And many of them have simply dropped out of the workforce in despair. There are ample resources to provide employment, but they're hidden away where they cannot be accessed in the overflowing pockets of uh, the super rich and the corporate sector, and particularly the big banks, which have been generously rewarded for having created a crisis serious enough to have almost brought down the domestic and even the global economy. And there are vast amounts of work to be done. The infrastructure is collapsing, the schools badly need repair and teachers, the transportation and energy systems have to be radically reconstructed, and there's a great deal more ranging from construction work to scientific research. But the system is so dysfunctional that it cannot put eager hands to needed work using the resources that would be readily available if the economy were designed to serve human needs rather than wealth beyond the dreams of avarice for a privileged few. It's actually hard to think of a more serious indictment of a socioeconomic system. Well, as you all know, the dysfunctional economy has been accompanied by very highly concentrated wealth, and with it, of course, political power follows at once from concentrated wealth. That, in turn, yields legislation that drives the cycle forward. Uh, inequality has reached historic heights. In the past decade, 95% of growth has gone to 1% of the population, actually to a small proportion of those. Uh, meanwhile, the general population has faced stagnation or decline. Uh, median real income in the United States is below its level in 1989. Uh, for, male, for males, median real income is below what it was in 1968. The uh, labor share of output has fallen to its lowest level since World War II. And poorer sectors have suffered severely. Uh, the United States has the highest poverty rate in the OECD, aside from Turkey. And that's pr perhaps not too surprising because the US also ranks near the bottom uh, in measures of social justice in the OECD. Uh, for African Americans, uh, household wealth has virtually disappeared during the latest crisis. Uh, we should recognize that the grim legacy of slavery which is one of the original sins of American society, along with the virtual elimination of the indigenous population, uh, that legacy has never been overcome. There's some amelioration, but not much. Well, uh, these things didn't just happen like a tornado. Uh, they are the results of uh, quite deliberate policies over roughly the past generation. Uh, the period of the neoliberal so-called assault on the population, uh, which has had similar effects elsewhere as well. And that's hardly surprising either. 
the fundamental doctrine of neoliberalism is, uh, was well expressed by Adam Smith, uh, what he called the vile maxim of the masters of mankind, all for ourselves and nothing for other people. And if the masters are given free reign, we should expect the kinds of social and economic disaster that we now see before our eyes. Well, there are alternatives, quoting Nobel laureate in econ economics, Joseph Stiglitz points out there are alternatives, but we will not find them in the self-satisfied complacency of the elites whose incomes and stock portfolios are once again soaring. Only some people, it seems, must adjust to a permanently lower standard of living. Uh, unfortunately, those people happen to be most people. Uh, in short, the vile maxim at work. Uh, these developments should not be confused with uh, idealized workings of capitalism and free markets. Uh, on the other hand, on quite the contrary, po uh, policies are carefully designed to protect the masters from market discipline. That has always been true back to the 18th century. And to ensure that they can uh, rely on the benef beneficence of the powerful nanny state that they carefully nurture for their benefit. Uh, but uh, let's continue the exercise of this us figuring out how to ruin an economy. I suppose we're intent on making the scandal even worse. Now, there are some good ways to proceed. So modern economies depend very heavily on R&D, research and development. Uh, fundamental work uh, comes primarily from the dynamic state sector on which the advanced economy heavily relies. Almost most of the IT revolution, uh, biology-based industries, and much else. Actually, that's a pattern that traces far back, but it's become much more critical since the uh, Second World War as the impact of science and technology on the society and the economy have greatly expanded. So a very good way to ruin the economy and the society would be to cut back on R&D, on federal R&D. And we can read about how that's done from the first issue of the uh, AAAS journal, American Association for Advancement of Science journal, uh, Science, the first issue in 2014. Here's what it says. Uh, the 2014 budget will continue what has been a decades-long slide in the ratio of federal R&D in the budget to the GDP. Now, this ratio is often used as a measure of how much a nation values basic research. It's fallen 25% in the last decade alone, and that's continuing. Uh, in the meantime, elsewhere internationally, investment in science is rising as nations throughout the world connect investment in R&D to the development of their human capital and their future prosperity. Uh, for example, the European Union's flagship research program, Horizon 2020, is set to receive a nearly 30% boost in 2014. The Chinese government's investment in R&D has been increasing uh, by percentages in the double digits for the last several years and is poised to become the world leader. Uh, you can draw the consequences without any comment. Uh, what's happening here is a very natural development of the imposition of uh, the business model of seeking short-term profit, uh, the future, the society, their, someone else's business. Uh, another way to undermine a healthy economy uh, is to encourage the growth of financial institutions, uh, giving them free reign by deregulation and using state power to underprice risk. Now, these are actually crucial features of the neoliberal era. Uh, from the 1970s, accelerating since, there's been enormous expansion of the financial sector of the economy. Uh, by 2007, right before the latest crash, it had reached about 40% of corporate profits. Well, economic growth has continued during this period, though not at the earlier pace, but it's uh, rather artificial. It's sustained by uh, repeated bubbles. 
the, each decade has had its bubble. The savings and loan bubble under Reagan, the tech bubble in the late Clinton years, and of course the housing bubble under Bush. Uh, when the last of these burst, it created a financial crisis that has had severe consequences for much of the global economy and uh, near depression conditions persist for much of the domestic population. Now, the costs of the uh, latest uh, of the housing bubble itself and loss of output are estimated by the Congressional Budget Office to be around $24 trillion. That's uh, largely the fault of the Fed which was mesmerized by uh, uh, quasi-religious doctrines about efficient markets and therefore uh, could not comprehend what was very obviously happening, happening right before their eyes as housing prices rate rose far beyond trend lines going back 100 years and the bubble that could have been pricked wasn't. Well, the primary mechanism for rewarding the agents of the crises is the government insurance policy, known informally as too big to fail. And that guarantee goes far beyond the direct bailouts. It extends to cheap credit, to artificially high credit ratings, and many other devices. And the scale is huge. There's a recent IMF study which found that Virtually the entire profit of the major banks traces to tacit government insurance. It reaches the level of $83 billion a year, according to analyses in the business press, it's Bloomberg News. Uh, the insurance policy, of course, leads to underpricing of risk, uh, hence making the next crisis more likely. Uh, after the most recent crisis, Several prominent economists, including Nobel laureates, raised the question of the general impact of financial institutions in the uh, casino economy of the neoliberal period. And they also pointed out that that had not been much studied by economists. But they suggested that inquiry would show that these institutions uh, might be harmful to the economy. And there are some who go much farther. So perhaps the most respected financial correspondent in the English-speaking world is Martin Wolf of the London Financial Times. Uh, he concludes that, uh, quote him, an out-of-control financial sector is eating out the modern market, market economy from inside, just as the larva of a spider wasp eats out the host in which it has been laid. Well, as in... Other developed societies, uh, the economy, the U.S. economy, it's actually a state capitalist economy, but it's partially market-based. And markets have uh, both positive and uh, negative features. So that tells us another good way to ruin an economy and a society. Uh, undermine the positive features and amplify the negative features. And in fact, huge resources are devoted to these tasks. Uh, the great benefit of markets is that they're supposed to provide consumer choice. It's only partially true, even in principle, but I'll put that aside. Uh, this uh, beneficial consequence results from informed consumers making rational choices, as you learned in your economics courses. That's the core principle of markets. And as you all know, there's an enormous industry which is devoted to undermining this principle by creating uninformed consumers who will make irrational choices. It's known as the advertising industry. Uh, in a functioning market economy, ads would provide information to consumers about the products that are available. Uh, all you have to do is turn on a TV set to see that the goal is exactly the opposite. It's to undermine markets by delusion and manipulation, making sure that there are uninformed consumers who will make irrational choices. And in part, these efforts reflect another tendency that undermines markets. That's the rise of oligopolies, which has actually advanced uh, considerably in recent years. Now, that offers opportunities to avoid price wars by tacit collusion uh, that shifts the goals of business to 
product differentiation, which is often quite meaningless, and it requires massive advertising to delude consumers. Uh, from an economic point of view, that's mostly waste, and it's uh, enormous in scale. Well, these are among the ways to undermine the positive features of markets. Uh, there's a negative feature of markets intrinsic to them. It's called a market inefficiency, and that's ignoring externalities. So when a firm makes a risky transaction, if it's paying attention, it takes, covers, it takes care to cover its own risk, but it does not cover, it does not consider systemic risk. That is the risk that the uh, loss will affect others, maybe bring down the market. Let's say when uh, AIG insurance collapsed, uh, tanking the economy, or actually it would have tanked the economy if the nanny state hadn't ridden to the rescue. Uh, here, the government insurance policy plays a crucial role in amplifying a harmful feature of markets. Actually, there is a much more serious case of ignoring externalities, namely destruction of the commons. Uh, there's a standard notion, which you've heard, called the tragedy of the commons, which is supposed to mean that if the commons are held by the general public, they'll be destroyed, so therefore they have to be privatized. Actually, if you take a look at the facts, the opposite is usually true. It's privatizing that destroys the commons, and for good reasons. Uh, and we certainly should be aware of it today. Uh, the most significant case of destroying the commons is environmental catastrophe. Uh, informed and rational people can hardly ignore the fact that uh, the drive for short-term profits is leading directly to severe economic threats and imminent ones within the next generation or two. But that's another externality that's, been, that's ignored. Uh, and in this case, there's no one around who can bail out the perpetrators. Can't run cap in hand to the nanny state and say, bail me out. Uh, or the future generations whose chances of decent survival uh, they're placing at great risk. Uh, well, uh, the, uh, a future historian, and there may not be one in fact, but if there is one, uh, such a historian will look back on the current scene uh, with some amazement. Uh, there are some who are trying to impede the threat of environmental catastrophe. There, there are others who are devoted to accelerating it. Uh, who are they? Well, in the forefront of the struggle to overcome the threat are those who we call primitive, uh, the First Nations in Canada, uh, indigenous people in Latin America, aboriginals in Australia, uh, tribal communities in India, and their counterparts all over the world. And uh, leading the race to disaster are the richest and most powerful countries in the world, the ones that have unique advantages, uh, primarily the United States and Canada. Uh, Canada, in particular, has become the scourge of the world with its uh, activities ranging from tar sands to mining activities that are destroying much of the world. Uh, uh, these are countries with unique advantages, and they're in the lead to the race to destruction. Uh, the suicidal drive is conducted with considerable euphoria about what's called a century of energy independence in which North America becomes the Saudi Arabia of the 21st century. Uh, the excitement is scarcely tainted by reflection on what the world will look like as fossil fuels are consumed with uh, unrestrained exuberance. There's even gloating over the fact that Europe is reducing its efforts to move towards sustainable energy. Reason, it can't compete with US production based on the cheaper energy that's destroying this, the world and society. Uh, the corporate sector has announced quite openly that it's carrying out major propaganda campaigns to convince the public that climate change, if it's happening at all, does not result from human activity. Now, these efforts are aimed at overcoming the excessive rationality of the public, which continues to be concerned about uh, the threats 
that scientists overwhelmingly regard as near certain and quite ominous. Uh, all of that makes sense under prevailing ideology and prevailing institutional structure, which is directed towards pursuing the vile maxim of the masters of mankind. And in this case, it goes well beyond ruining an economy. Professor Chomsky, thank you for your remarkable insights. I remain curious, however, as to what your thoughts are, if any, regarding cryptocurrency and Bitcoins in general, more specifically their effect on the global economy. I have no opinion about it. I suspect it's a, I suspect it's a fad that'll lead to some crisis and collapse. But. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, right here. Uh, Professor Chomsky. Um, in, the, in cases like in the southeast of Mexico, in Chiapas, we have several communities, you know, juntas de buen gobierno and otherwise, that have tried to fight the corrupt aspects of capitalism in their own ways. And although they suffer still attacks from it, they have managed in one way or another some sort of autonomy. But these people, first of all, they live in a rural environment and that identity is deeply rooted in, you know, to the land and indigenous practices that become, have become tradition and mysticism. How do we bring this aspect of attacks on capitalism to the urban environment and to cities, for example, like Detroit or Flint or Camden or Baltimore that have seen the worst attacks of neoliberal policies and have extinguished all identity as proletarian unity through the attacks of vulture capitalism? Well, actually, it's a, a Detroit is an interesting case. I mean, Detroit is overwhelmingly black. And I'm, I can't find a document, but I'm convinced that that's the reason why it's being sent down the tube. If it was a white community, there'd be plenty of mechanisms available to bail it out, and just as there are mechanisms available to bail out AIG and other criminals. Uh, but uh, the uh, but, uh, uh, and it's kind of interesting how it's done. So, for example, there's uh, there's an attack on pensions, the pensions, uh, the it, in violation of the state constitution, pensions are being cut back because of the crisis. Uh, this is not always done, so it takes AIG again. Uh, after their uh, largely fraudulent, at least incompetent, probably criminal actions had practically destroyed the economy, and they were bailed out massively by the taxpayer, but, uh, but the executives got huge bonuses. And there was some protest about that, but it was pointed out by eminent economists, uh, Lawrence Summers for one, that we have to recognize sanctity of contract in that case, and not in the case of workers in uh, uh, Detroit who had already paid. Remember, pension means a cutback in wages. You're cutting back your wages. You'd already paid. You'd done the work. But in that case, sanctity of contract doesn't matter. Now, these are all parts of the neoliberal ideology, and it's had a very negative effect every, just about everywhere in the world. Now, there are places where, where there has been resistance. Uh, in fact, there was an interesting study that just came out of the uh, Economic Commission of Latin America, UN Commission on uh, Poverty in Latin America, and a very interesting result. Actually, the results strongly supported a principle that uh, Cuban nationalist leader Jose Marti had denunciated over a century ago. The farther you are from the United States, the better off you are. Well, that's exactly what it showed. Uh, there were countries where, in Latin America where poverty had been very sharply reduced, and namely in the southern cone, where they had abandoned the neoliberal doctrines and had moved towards substantial, not total, but substantial social reform. Uh, Brazil and Venezuela were the outliers, the most reduction. Uh, there were also countries where uh, poverty had not been reduced, like Guatemala and Honduras. Those have been under U.S. domination forever. The worst one, and this gets back to Chiapas, was Mexico. Uh, Mexico is hailed in the, liter in the 
general literature is a great triumph. Actually, it's an economic disaster. Uh, Mexico was the only country in which poverty had sharply reduced last, increased last year. Uh, and uh, so it's pulling down the average. Well, okay, that's, these are all, uh, you know, the, the, these are not small effects. They're significant facts. And the answer to your question is it's in the hands of people like you, uh, just like trying to save the world from uh, the environmental catastrophe that's coming is in your hands. Nobody else is going to do it. Um, again, sir, thank you, all three of you, for coming. Um, you sort of led directly into my question. I was going to ask, and that's obviously quite broad, but what can we do? What do we focus on? Do we focus on working through the system and try and work through the government? Do we work with social movements? Do we work with the indigenous cultures within these smaller localized communities abroad? that are the ones that are directly impacted by the externalization, like, where do we go from here? You know? Now, all of those are good things to do. Uh, and there's no one right answer for everybody. Uh, each person has their own interests, proclivities, talents, and so on. And every one of the things you mentioned offers plenty of opportunities to do important things. And uh, what's going to be significant, uh, the question is, can this, um, there are two trajectories in the process. One of them is towards destruction, and it's not that far off. And it's inherent in the institutions of the society. I mean, it's almost an institutional requirement of neoliberal capitalism that it destroy, the, that it destroy society and the economy for the reasons I've kind of hinted at but, and were mentioned before, but it's just built in. Uh, another trajectory is trying to overcome it. Well, we can't leave that to the indigenous people in the world. They happen to be in the lead, but they don't have the resources. We have the resources. So therefore, the question is, can we amplify that trajectory? But that's in the hands of people like you. And uh, the opportunities are there, and they have to be taken. And not without much delay. Thank you for your... Okay, it's, no, it's not? Okay, thank you for your words, Professor Chomsky. What I wanted to ask is that when you mentioned the elites who, as you say, sort of have been acquiring the wealth of avarice over the past several of decades, Given your background as a cognitive scientist, I was wondering if you think there's any way that these elites can eventually be convinced, perhaps, that their lifestyle and their sort of greed for, for wealth is unsustainable for society as a whole. It's possible, but in fact, you know, it's, I mean, I wouldn't count on it. You know, it's got to be, uh, uh, it's, uh, in fact, it's not, if, if you go back, say, 50 years, 60 years, there was a kind of a different culture uh, in management. Uh, there was a sense in which management had concern for the future of the corporation. So, for example, when Charles Wilson said, you know, what's good for General Motors is good for the economy, it wasn't totally wrong. They were concerned with keeping the corporation alive, keep, uh, making sure that the workforce had some kind of income. Henry Ford was famous for that. Uh, and that's gone. The neoliberal doctrine is the opposite. You have to have concern for the vile maxim. And now that means concern for uh, short, very short-term profit, high profit for the next quarter. So you can then get your bonus and maybe run away and the corporation will collapse. Who cares? And the society with it. That's a significant change in kind of corporate culture. And it conceivably could go back, but my own feeling is much more significant changes are needed than that. One last question in the back. All right. Um, well, the issues of corporatocracy are always discussed. But how, was, how are people, average people, supposed to, um, how are their word supposed to um, go ahead of the big money donors and the uh, corporate lobbyists in Washington when they have all the finances to um, fund these political campaigns? They do, and uh, it's, very, it's very significant. I mean, take almost anything that's happening, say the 
uh, TPP, the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. Uh, this is a, uh, you know about this, it's a, a massive treaty. It's called a free trade treaty. It has no, almost nothing to do with trade and certainly nothing to do with free trade. It's a treaty, we don't really know much about it because it's being carried out in secret the way these things are done. The population's not supposed to know about them. Not total secret for the reasons you mentioned. It's not a secret to the hundreds of corporate lawyers and corporate lobbyists who are writing the legislation. They surely know about it. But it's kept in secret from the rest of us, although parts have leaked out. Uh, one part that leaked out a couple of weeks ago was the part on uh, what's called intellectual property. That's a fancy term for robbery. It's a highly protectionist mechanism to try to ensure that pharmaceutical corporations and media corporations make exorbitant profits, uh, which uh, they have absolutely no economic justification for. You can, I think, easily show this. But that's what you'd expect when a treaty is being designed by corporate lobbyists and uh, corporate lawyers. What else should they be doing? So, well, and the courts have, have helped on this by reducing the, uh, there were some limits before on the extent to which uh, corporate wealth could purchase elections. This goes back to 1907, but uh, they were, they've been pretty much dismantled. And now it's uh, free for all. Uh, it's, uh, uh, to be elected a president, you have to be able to spend billions of dollars. Uh, it also holds for Congress. Uh, there's a very uh, careful, there's a very good political economist, Tom, Thomas Ferguson over at UMass, who's been studying this for years. He's done the main work on it. And he just came out with his, uh, uh, analysis of the House of the Congressional, the House uh, elections in 2012. As you probably know, the uh, the uh, House election had a Democratic majority for the vote, but through various devices, it has a Republican majority in the House. It turns out there's almost a straight line of, uh, of uh, the correlation between campaign spending and victory is virtually a straight line. I mean, things have now reached the point where to get a, um, a, 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 a the chair, the chair, become chair of a powerful committee, a significant committee in Congress, it used to be uh, based on seniority and service. Now it's based on putting money into the party coffers. You have to buy it. Uh, so the whole system is being turned into something bought. It has very limited re resemblance to democracy. It's plutocracy. And the only way to deal with this is by mass public organization to counter it. And in fact, uh, and that requires associations. Uh, the major association that's always been in the lead on this is unions. So naturally, during the neoliberal period, in fact before, there's been a massive attack on unions to try to undermine and destroy them. That makes sense. Uh, they're the one major organization that allows uh, working people, poor people, to, to come together uh, to work out their programs, formulate the demands, to defend their rights, to uh, press for you know, progressive developments elsewhere in the society. So sure, they have to be wiped out. Uh, by now, private sector unions are less than 7% of the workforce. So there has to be an attack on public unions because they've managed to survive. And you see that before your eyes, it's happening all over. But unless, uh, you know, what sociologists call secondary associations, uh, groups of people uh, uh, can manage to get together and organize, uh, then uh, there's not going to be any way to counter this uh, uh, vicious cycle that concentrates wealth, concentrates political power, leads to legislation and court decisions and so on, which, which accelerate the process. And it does have a destructive suicidal tendency. So the question is, can that be reconstructed? Well, again, your hands. Thank you, Professor Chomsky.